Hello and welcome everybody, my name is Elliot, and in this physics mini lesson, I'm going to tell you about one of the most beautiful love stories in the universe. It's about the relationship between symmetries and conservation laws in physics, and we call it Noether's Theorem. But seriously, Noether's Theorem is one of the most profound results in physics, and it reflects a deep connection between these two separate concepts, symmetries of nature and conserved quantities, that isn't at all obvious at first glance. You probably encountered several examples of conserved quantities already in your first physics class. When studying projectile motion, for example, you can show that the total energy E, kinetic plus potential, is a constant, independent of time. That's what a conserved quantity is, a function that takes the same value at any instant along the trajectory of a particle or system. Other examples you might have run into are the total momentum and total angular momentum of an isolated system. On the other side of Noether's theorem are symmetries. For example, if you think about the gravity field of a point like star, or the electric field of a charged particle, it appears the same no matter what direction you look at it from. That's an example of spherical symmetry. You can pick up the system and rotate it around any way you like, but it won't change anything about the physics. We therefore call this kind of symmetry rotation invariance. Other examples of symmetries are spatial translation invariance meaning if you can pick up your experiment and move it over to another lab, or another corner of the universe if you like, without any consequences. And time translation invariance, meaning that the laws of physics look the same yesterday as they do today, and as they will tomorrow. Physicists are obsessed with symmetries. When you hand a physicist a new theory, the first thing they're likely to do is try to find as many symmetries in it as they can. It's symmetry that enables us to solve the quantum mechanics of the hydrogen atom, to write down the space-time geometry around a spherically symmetric black hole, to classify the kinds of particles that appear in the standard model of particle physics. And in this enormously important subject of symmetry, the central pillar is this theorem, due to the German mathematician Emmy Noether about 100 years ago. Noether's theorem says that for every continuous symmetry you can find in a theory, there'll be a corresponding conserved quantity. The two go hand in hand. For example, the rotation invariance we were just talking about is what leads, by Noether's theorem, to the conservation of angular momentum. Likewise, spatial translation symmetry is what's responsible for momentum conservation. And time translation symmetry is the source of energy conservation. In this video, I'm going to show you how Noether's theorem works. It's easiest to understand in the Lagrangian formulation of mechanics. So you'll probably want to have seen at least one of my earlier videos explaining how Lagrangians work. I'll put those links in the description, but you don't have to be an expert, and I'll try to make the lesson as accessible as possible. You can get the notes for free at the link in the description, and please leave any questions or requests for future topics in the comment section. I also recently set up a Patreon page, so if you're finding my videos interesting and would like to help support me, you can head to patreon.com slash physicswithelliot. It really means a lot to me, and I'm so grateful to you for watching and leaving comments and helping me grow the channel. Okay, let's start by thinking about the simplest possible setup, a single particle moving in one dimension. We define the Lagrangian by taking the difference between the kinetic energy and potential energy, and the action is the integral of the Lagrangian over time. According to the principle of least action, the particle is going to choose the path for which s is minimized, or at least extremized. Let's quickly review how that works, since we're going to follow the same line of reasoning in a second to derive Noether's theorem. So, if we take our physical solution, x of t, and make a little deformation of it by an infinitesimal function, epsilon of t, it introduces some wiggles on top of our curve. Epsilon here is any infinitesimal function of t that vanishes at the starting and ending times. That's because we don't want to change the endpoints of the path. If we're sitting at a minimum of the action, it shouldn't change at all under this deformation at leading order in epsilon. That's the defining property of an extremal point. When you take a little step away, your function is constant because you're sitting at a point where the rate of change of the function vanishes. When we make a little change in x of t, we can find the change in the Lagrangian by taking the differential, like we learned about in the principle of least action video. So to get the change in L, first we take the derivative of the kinetic energy term, that gives us 2 times 1 half m x dot times the change in x dot, that's epsilon dot. Then from the second term, we get minus u prime of x times the change in x. Then in our usual routine for finding the equation of motion, we want to integrate the first term by parts. That means we rewrite mx dot 
times d epsilon by dt. As d by dt of the whole thing, mx dot epsilon, minus mx double dot times epsilon. That's going to let us pull out a common factor of epsilon. And so the change in the Lagrangian is minus mx double dot plus u prime of x, all that times epsilon, plus d by dt of mx dot epsilon. Now, when we integrate this to get the change in the action, the second term isn't going to contribute anything because we assumed that epsilon vanished at the initial and final times. Then, the fact that the integral of the first term is supposed to vanish for any epsilon of t means that the thing multiplying it in the integrand has got to be zero. That's what gives us the equation of motion, mx double dot equals minus u prime of x. And we recognize that as the f equals ma equation for a particle in a potential u, because minus u prime of x is the force. So that's how we derive the equation of motion from the principle of least action. But our formula for the change in the Lagrangian is more general than that. We'd had in mind a deformation here by epsilon of t, where epsilon is an infinitesimal function that vanishes at the starting and ending times. But we didn't actually make any assumptions when we computed the change in the Lagrangian, other than epsilon being infinitesimal. Epsilon could have been any function in that formula, even a function of x itself. So, to avoid confusion with the special case we had in mind for the principle of least action, let me rewrite the transformation as x goes to x plus eta, where eta can be any infinitesimal function of t and or x. Then, the same argument shows that the change in the Lagrangian is going to be dl equals minus the equation of motion times eta plus d by dt of mx dot times eta. By EOM here, I mean the thing that vanishes when x is the physical trajectory, mx double dot plus u prime. Now this brings us to symmetries, conservation laws, and Noether's theorem. A symmetry is an infinitesimal transformation of the coordinates that leaves the Lagrangian invariant. There are more general kinds of symmetries, but these are the simplest, so we'll start here. So for these very specific transformations, which will depend on the details of the Lagrangian for the problem at hand, we've got dl equals zero. Now again, our formula for dl here holds for any deformation, x goes to x plus eta, of any path, not necessarily the actual physical solution. But if x of t does satisfy the equation of motion, then the first term on the right-hand side here is zero. Therefore, for a symmetry transformation of the trajectory that satisfies the equation of motion, we learn that this last term is also going to be equal to zero. And therefore, this quantity, mx dot times eta, is a constant, independent of time. This is Noether's theorem. For every infinitesimal symmetry of the Lagrangian, we obtain a conserved quantity, dq by dt equals zero. And here in our one-dimensional example, q was just mx dot times eta. Let's start with the simplest example, a free particle. Don't worry, we'll get to more interesting examples in a second. Then u is just equal to zero, and the Lagrangian is one half m x dot squared. Notice that since it's only the derivative x dot of x of t that appears in the Lagrangian, there's one symmetry here that's particularly easy to spot. We can shift x by any constant without changing the Lagrangian. This symmetry is called spatial translation invariance. It means that we can pick up our particle and slide it over to a new point without changing anything significant. And Noether's theorem tells us that mx dot times a to zero is therefore conserved. But since a to zero itself was an arbitrary constant, we also know that mx dot itself is a constant, and we recognize that as the momentum of the particle. Therefore, the spatial translation invariance of a free particle implies by Noether's theorem that the particle's momentum is conserved. Momentum conservation is due to translation symmetry in space. But okay, a free particle isn't all that interesting. What happens when we turn on a potential u? Now when we shift x by a constant, the Lagrangian in general won't be invariant anymore. The first term is still invariant, but from the second term, we get minus the derivative of u times a to zero. And that means we only have a symmetry if u prime is equal to zero, which means the potential is a horizontal line. But that just gives us back a free particle. So we learn that translation invariance is broken if our single particle is moving in a non-trivial potential. But that's exactly what we should expect. If we turn on a potential u, 
that means the particle is going to be subject to a force. F equals minus the derivative of U. And Newton's second law says that the force on a particle equals the rate of change of its momentum. So the momentum isn't constant anymore because there's a force acting on the particle. To give an example, let's look at the harmonic oscillator potential. U equals 1 half K times X minus L squared. Then this Lagrangian describes a particle attached to a spring. But of course this system isn't translation invariant. If you pick up the mass and slide it around, you'll stretch or compress the spring, and therefore change the system. So, there's no translation symmetry, there's a force on the mass, and momentum is not conserved. On the other hand, say we had two masses connected by a spring. Again, if we pick up one of the masses and move it around, we stretch the spring and change the system. But if we pick up the whole system, both masses, the spring, everything, and slide them around without changing their relative positions, then we haven't really done anything. So the system is translation invariant. The Noether's theorem says that the total momentum of the system is conserved, as you should show for yourself by a similar kind of reasoning like we just went through for one particle. And again, that's what we should expect from Newton's law. Remember that Newton's second law for a system says that the total external force equals the rate of change of the total momentum. A system with no external force acting on it is called isolated, and therefore the total momentum of an isolated system is a constant. And indeed, our two masses connected by a spring is an isolated system. There's the spring force acting on the masses, but that's an internal force because it acts between two components of the system. Now let's go back to our one particle mass on a spring example, but this time let's graduate to two dimensions. So picture this as something like a hockey puck on a frictionless ice rink that's attached to a spring that's fixed in the center of the rink. Once again, the momentum is not going to be conserved because the system is not translation invariant. If you try to pick up the particle and slide it around, you'll stretch the spring and change the system. However, if you were to rotate the mass around on a circle, you would keep the length of the spring fixed. So we therefore have rotational symmetry. Let's let x and y be the coordinates of the mass. Then the length of the spring here is x squared plus y squared square root, and so the potential energy is 1 half k times that length minus l squared. The square root of x squared plus y squared here is just the radial coordinate r. So that suggests we might be better off using polar coordinates r and theta. Then the potential is 1 half k times r minus l squared. As for the kinetic energy, we're going to get 1 half m times r dot squared, that comes from the radial speed of the particle, plus the angular speed squared, r squared theta dot squared. That last bit is just your old friend v equals omega r from circular motion, where omega equals theta dot. So the Lagrangian is that kinetic energy minus the potential of our spring. Now remember how we saw for a free particle at the beginning that because the Lagrangian, 1 half m x dot squared, only depended on the derivative of the coordinate, it was therefore invariant when we shifted x by a constant. Well, this Lagrangian looks a little more complicated, but notice that there aren't any thetas anywhere, only this theta dot, and therefore we have a symmetry that shifts theta by a constant. This is the rotation symmetry. And indeed, we would have found rotation invariance for any potential that doesn't depend on theta. If the potential is only a function of how far away you are from the origin, then you can rotate around it at will. The same goes for a particle orbiting a star, or an electron in the electric field of a proton, for example. You can find the conserved quantity that goes along with the symmetry in the same way that we did for the free particle. And in these kinds of simple cases, you can also see it directly from the Euler-Lagrange equation, which remember was d by dt of dl by d theta dot equals dl by d theta. So whenever a coordinate doesn't explicitly appear in the Lagrangian, the right-hand side of the Euler-Lagrange equation is automatically equal to zero. And so the equation says that dl by d theta dot is a constant. We get dl by d theta dot equals mr squared times theta dot, which you hopefully recognize as the angular momentum of the particle. So the rotational symmetry here means, by Noether's theorem, that the angular momentum is conserved. Likewise, in all of these examples, you can show that time translation invariance is responsible for energy conservation. 
And these relationships between spatial translations, rotations, and time translations with momentum, angular momentum, and energy conservation are very general. This is the beautiful way of understanding the world that know this theorem grants us. Conserved quantities like energy and momentum aren't random coincidences that occasionally show up and make it easier to solve problems. They reflect deep symmetry properties about whatever system we're investigating. If you keep studying physics, you'll find that symmetry principles play an ever more important role in our understanding of nature, and know this theorem is therefore a monumentally important result. Again, you can get the notes that I wrote up for this video for free at the link in the description. Please give the like button a click while you're down there, leave me a comment, and subscribe if you haven't yet. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you very soon with another physics lesson.